Hello everybody and thank you for clicking on the video. Today I'd like to talk about differentiators. This is actually a follow-up somewhat on the integrator video which we just did last week where an integrator will take a square wave and give us a ramp at the output. A differentiator will take a ramp and give us a square wave. So guess what? It can be used for wave shaping as well. So we'll talk about the theory behind its operation some of the math that's involved in getting outputs, determining what those are, what the basic configuration is, as you can see here, what we can use them for, and then, of course, we'll do the lab as we always do, and I've already built the circuit, so this is our practical integrator circuit, and we'll test that out with some waveforms and see if that matches again with, with theory. So without any ado, let's get started. We'll start our analysis by looking at a ideal differentiator and we'll use an ideal op amp which means of course that we have an infinite impedance on our inverting and our non-inverting inputs, zero impedance on the output, and everything works perfectly and we're going to just use two components, a capacitor at the input and a feedback resistor. A practical integrator is going to have to have a few more parts in it to function properly and efficiently and we'll talk about that in, uh, in short order. If we look at what a differentiator is or what differentials are, there's an entire branch of calculus called differential calculus which covers this and of course we're not going to have an entire class of differential calculus so we're just going to kind of cut down to the to the to the meat of this uh, entire problem and look at it uh, in a little bit more simple fashion. What a differentiator does as far as we're concerned is it takes the rate of change of a voltage at the input and gives us a voltage at the output that's proportional to the rate of change. So we have an input And we're looking at the change in the voltage over a change in a period of time. And that is going to give us a output. So if the rate of change in voltage is really fast over a short period of time, the output voltage will be very high. If the rate of change is very slow, the output voltage is going to be very low. Another way to think of a differentiator, and, and a square wave gives you a, a really good example of that, or a triangle wave actually gives you a good example of that. So we have our triangle wave, and what's the rate of change on a triangle? Well, it's, it's, absolute, it's linear. Well, at least we hope we, it is. It's not a triangle otherwise. So for every change in time from... The, this point we have a proportional change in the voltage at this point so let's say it's a one-to-one -one relationship we, we go over one let's say millisecond and we go up one volt and we go over another millisecond and we're going to go up another one volt until we reach the peak so the rate of change is very steady so by our definition what we're looking at is the rate of change over time is very steady and the output voltage is supposed to be proportional to that rate of voltage in time. If the input voltage is going up at a steady rate over a period of time, the output voltage is going to be a square wave. We have a starting point, let's, start, let's say time zero and now we have a beginning of a rate of change so we create a voltage remember the output voltage amplitude is proportional to how fast this changes we have a steady rate of change so the voltage begins to go up at this point we have the rate of change of our first period what happens in the next period of time the rate of change is exactly the same so is there going to be an increase in the voltage no it's going to stay at that point 
We go on a little bit farther in time. Is there a rate of change? Nope, no rate of change. Everything stays steady. And it's going to do so all the way across until we start getting the descending part of this waveform. Now what happens? The voltage now goes in the opposite direction, but it does it at a steady rate. So the voltage begins to, we have a change in the voltage. So we have something from the peak voltage here. So we'll indicate that to be at this point. And now we have a change in, let's say, one millisecond again, and we have a, a one volt change. The voltage then drops to, its, to a, a negative level. Now the rate of change is constant again, from here to here. One millisecond and one volt. One millisecond, one volt. Output is not going to change. It's going to be the same voltage as in the previous time period and the next time period, and the next time period. So that's a differentiator. It's looking at the difference, differentiation, the difference between any two points, and it's giving us a voltage proportional to how fast this changes. So if this change is steady, the difference at the output is going to be steady. It's still going to give us a voltage, but it's going to be a steady voltage. If we then take this voltage, or this signal, and apply it to our op amp. Because we're applying it to the inverting input, everything at the output is going to be the opposite polarity. So our, if our input waveform is going positive and then negative, our output waveform should be going negative first and then coming over here and then starting to go positive and, and so forth. So we have that 180 degree phase shift that is common in the circuit and then we're going to just you know, repeat the cycle over and over again. So a differentiator is nothing more than a device that looks at the rate of change of the voltage over a period of time and gives us a voltage proportional to that rate of change at the output. The faster this changes, the bigger this changes. Now this is all true because we have a RC time constant that we're going to be dealing with set up by our, our input capacitor, CI, and our feedback resistor. And there's an entire section or lecture that I could do on time constants in integrators and differentiators, but that would be, uh, I think that we'll save that for, for another time. So let's take a look at some of the other wave shapes that we would see in this and apply a little bit of our time constant theory to that application. For our differentiator to work properly, we need a short time constant circuit. A short time constant circuit is one in which the time constant is far shorter than the time of the applied waveform. If we had a circuit that had a 1 millifarad cap and a 1 k ohm resistor, to get the time constant, you probably recall that it's just R times C. And in this case, we would have a time constant of, of one second. And the total time for charge would be five time constants. So we're looking at five, sec five seconds for this capacitor to charge completely. So we want this capacitor to be able to charge really, really rapidly with whatever input voltage we have to get that really quick change in the output voltage. The waveform that we would get on our output is going to be whatever we get on, whatever voltage we get on RF. And we know that any voltage on RF is going to be based on the current that has to be going through that resistor. So let's go ahead and just graph that. Let's make another circuit up to using our example. And this time we'll use one microfarad and one K. And we'll have a time constant then of one millisecond. And total charge on the capacitor is going to occur after five time constants or five milliseconds. If we apply a waveform and let's make it 200 hertz. That gives us an input frequency or an input time 
of 5 milliseconds. But you have to remember that the positive and the negative side of this waveform, assuming that we're dealing with a square wave now, is going to be 2.5 seconds positive and 2.5 milliseconds negative. So that's not going to work. So we're going to have to go to some other frequency. Let's, uh, let's go to 100 hertz. So this is going to give us a time then of 10 milliseconds. So the time constant of the circuit is definitely smaller than the period of the input frequency. So at 100 hertz we have a 10 millisecond wave and we have a 5 millisecond positive part of the cycle and a 5 millisecond part negative part of the cycle. So our definition is okay. So we have five time constants, completely charges. If we now look at this as a function of the voltage on the capacitor, the current on the capacitor and the resistor, these are going to be equal since they're in, in the same path. IR and IC are going to be equal. And then we're going to have the voltage on the resistor. So our voltage on the cap, let's make the assumption that we start out with everything at zero volts. So I should give myself a little bit more space here. Clear that out. So our voltage on the cap, we're going to say it starts at zero, and we apply the voltage to it. And because we're giving the, the cap sufficient time to charge completely, we're going to get that 63.2% per time constant charge that you hope you remember from AC. And we're going to get a wave, something like that, until we get to a complete charge. So one time constant, two, three, four, five. So completely charged at this point. Current is only going to flow through our resistive component while there is no voltage on the capacitor. If I had 10 volts applied, in the first time constant, we're going to have 63, 6.32 volts of, on the capacitor, which means that there's only going to be 3.68, I believe, on the resistor. So the current is starting to drop. Remember, it's just going to be V divided by R to give us the current. So when we get this big spike in the voltage on the capacitor, the current on the capacitor is doing just the opposite. We have a really high current initially and then the current is going to fall down to zero after five time constants and we end up with a spike. So a big rate of change initially and then a small change. The voltage on the resistor is going to follow whatever the current is on the resistor. So we're going to have this same wave shape that we had before. So now we have a spike. If I slow this waveform down even farther, let's say to 20 hertz, now the capacitor charge is a lot faster. The spike is a lot quicker on the voltage and the currents. And now I get an even faster spike on our resistor. So this is our output now because the resistor is connected to the output. So if I apply a square wave to this circuit. The output should look like a pulse. A very rapidly changing pulse at the input should give me a big change in the output voltage. That's our basic definition for a differentiator. Change in the voltage, delta V over delta T. A large change in the voltage over a short change in time should give us a big voltage at the output. And once we reach a steady state, there's no longer a change in the output. So what happens? We get this big spike in the voltage over a short time at the input. That should give us a really fast spike at the output, going negative because we're inverting. And then the voltage is going to go down to nothing. So we get that decay. It stays at zero because there's no change between these points. Remember our definition. 
There's no change between these points. Everything stays constant. All of a sudden, the voltage changes polarity, goes, starts to go negative, and we get a positive spike at the output. So in a square wave, we should get spikes at the output. When we apply the triangle wave, remember rate of change over time, constant rate of change over time, so it's a very steady value, we get, we get the change in voltage, it stays constant, polarity changes, goes in the opposite direction, steady rate of change over time, and then we get that. So a square wave in should give us pulses out, a triangle wave in should give us a square wave out, and of course the uh, polarities, the, it's, going to be, it's going to be inverted between input and output. Well, what happens if I put a sine wave into the circuit? Well, for a sine wave, this acts just like a high-pass filter. So we're going to get a sine wave at the output, but we're going to get a phase shift, and that's just because all of all of the, well, we have the inversion, plus we have a phase shift in our capacitor. And without going into any great deal in the mathematics of it, we're just going to get a cosine wave at the output. And this cosine wave is going to be based on the gain of whatever RF is divided by XC. Our gain in the circuit would be RF over XC and negative because it's an inverting device. And you can see that our gain, as we go up in frequency, the gain is actually going to go higher and higher. And this is one of those factors that I mentioned earlier that this isn't the perfect op amp to use because XC dropping means that this gain is going to go infinite and we're going to start getting a saturation value at the output. Well, what would happen if we had a waveform whose slope or voltage changed? And so we'll use a constant rate of time and let's see if we can flip this over and get a little bit more workspace. So we'll have an input that starts at zero volts and it goes for a certain period of time stays at zero and then all of a sudden we get a really rapid change in a voltage over a short period of time and then we get a slower rate of change over the next period of time. What's our waveform going to look like at the output? Rate of change over time gives us amplitude. So we start out with, this is our input, and we have an output here and again we're going to start at zero volts so we have zero volts at the start because it's going positive the out the output is going to go negative we have a really rapid rate of change over a short period of time so we're going to get a substantial voltage change for this period for the two cycles or the two little blocks that this is on and now our rate of change slows down and because the rate of change slows down, the output now is going to actually go down in value. So it's going to be flat like that. If we now went to a another increase, and let's say that it was a, another slow rate of change, a little bit sharper than that. Now, because we have a sh uh, an increase in the slope, the rate of change has occurred, we're going to have an increase in the output voltage. So you can see how this tracks the input. The faster the rate of change is here, the bigger the voltage changes at the output. Now let's take a look at our practical circuit and see how we get the equations to determine voltage out and run those numbers through our practical circuit and then check them on the breadboard to see if theory and practice hold out this is our practical differentiator and you'll see that we have added two components a feedback capacitor and an input resistor these are here to prevent the circuit from being excessively sensitive to high frequencies and also to prevent the gain of the circuit from going too high the gain of the circuit is going to be determined by the value of RF divided by XC in or XCI. You can guess what's going to happen as the frequency goes up. The capacitive reactance is going to 
drop, and as XC drops, the gain becomes excessive. So there is a point where XC becomes so low that the gain would go too high, and that's where RI begins to take over. So RI now becomes the dominant factor in the circuit's input, and now we have 22K over the 2.2K value. So we're limiting the circuit to a gain of, of 10. The capacitor here is to eliminate any high frequency components and improve the stability of the circuit overall. If there are any high frequency components that are on our input signal, this capacitor will cause them to be bypassed and they won't affect the output as significantly as they would have. They might still be present, but they're going to limit that quite a bit. The calculation that you see here is pretty much, well, it is the, the standard one for getting the, the output voltage of a differentiator. And they, they got this by going back to some, some first principles from AC, in which we know that the charge on a capacitor is equal to the current in times the time. And the charge on the capacitor is going to be equal to the capacitance, and in our case it's capacitance in, so I'll put CI, times the voltage. In our case it's in, so I'm just going to put voltage in. If we set all of this equal to itself, we would end up with Vn times Ci equals In times the time. And doing a little bit of, of math magic on it, we would get In equals the capacitance in times the voltage applied, so V in over time. All right, what's the voltage out? So we're going to ignore the cap right now. We're going to start at a low frequency. So the voltage out is going to be whatever voltage is present on our resistor RF. So voltage out would be equal to the value of the resistor RF times whatever current is going through it. Well, the current going through it has to be the I in current because we have an infinite input impedance on our, or our inverting input, and that means that there's no current that's coming in from the input that's going into this part of the circuit, and at low frequencies, this is extremely high uh, capacitive reactance, Xc, so all of our current, I in, must be going through RF. If that's the case, we can substitute the IN calculation with our RF, and we then would get C in V in over T. So this is IN. So there's our calculation, and that's how it, how it came about. So in you know we're looking for changes in voltage over changes in time so this is this is the calculation as it's shown here when we are doing these calculations and we are using a square wave in and you know getting whatever wave it is output square wave in would give us pulses at the output and of course our ramp and that's what we're shooting for our ramp in would give us square waves at the output whenever we're using this calculation, it really doesn't apply perfectly to these kinds of waves because what we have are, are apples to oranges and, and we have different frequencies components. In a square wave, we have a lot of low frequency odd numbered harmonics. In a triangle wave, we have the higher frequency odd order harmonics. And to get amplitudes between these two steps, we have to do some, some rather, com well, not really complicated mathematics, but involved mathematics using Fourier transforms. And if we wanted to find out what the actual voltage out would be for our circuit, we couldn't just compare, you know, say V out is equal to this. We actually have to do some transforms as well. And I'm trying to keep this relatively simple. 
So the easiest thing to do in taking in the transforms into account, but this is only applicable to changing a triangle wave to a square wave, is to multiply everything by 2. That's the relationship between these input waveforms and the output waveforms. So that's where that 2 comes from. That's because we're doing apples and oranges. We also can't really get a gain calculation for this kind of circuit because we're comparing two different types of waveforms to one another, completely different frequency domains uh, as far as the components are concerned. So we can't say that we ha start out with you know, uh, 10 dB of, uh, of square wave and end up with uh, 15 dB of, of of pulse. So we really can't do that. So that's uh, that's unfortunate. Now if we were dealing with strictly a square wave at the input, or a sine wave, I'm sorry, if we're dealing with strictly a sine wave, then we can do the gain calculations because then this is nothing more than a high pass circuit. So a sine wave coming in, as you recall, is going to give us a a cosine wave at the output. So according to our little derivation and you know just throwing the value 2 in because we're not going to do the transforms between the different frequencies, we can use this to determine the voltage out, the square wave voltage out, given a known input for our triangle wave. And so we'll apply those these values to some um, we'll apply these component values to some voltages and see what we get out. So we'll start by using, we know RF, so that's going to be 2 point, or 22K ohms, and we know the value of CI, so that's 4.7 nanofarads, and multiply the two together. And our voltage in, so we'll start with a 1 volt peak-to-peak -peak signal at 400 hertz. So our 1 volt peak to peak signal for VN is going to be 500 millivolts peak. The T, the time that we're going to have that change in, is going to be for half the period of this wave. So what we're looking for as we apply our wave, we want to know if I have a change from 0 up to 500 millivolts, peak, how much voltage will that give me at the output? So that 500 millivolt input is only present for half of the period of, of this wave. So if we have 400 hertz, that would give us 2.5 milliseconds for the entire time, but only 1.25 for this positive going ramp. So we have to divide this by 1.25 milliseconds. And because we are using a differentiator to get us to get a square wave from triangle wave, we know we have to multiply everything here by 2. And doing so will give us a voltage at the output of 82.72 millivolts peak. So this wave at the output should be a square wave whose negative peak is going to be 82.72 millivolts in amplitude. And then when it changes its potential, we should get, if it's, and also if it's symmetrical, we should get a positive 82.72 millivolt peak square wave. So the peak-to-peak -peak value should be about 165 millivolts peak-to-peak, -peak, or just a little bit more. You can see what would happen if the voltage went up. That would be an increase in, in voltage. That would make this part of the equation go up, so our ramps or our outputs would get bigger. And also, if our rate of change got faster, if we started changing the frequency component, that's going to change this part of the equation. As frequency goes up, of course, time is going to get smaller. With this getting smaller, the output will be larger, and the voltage again will go up on the output. I should explain how I got the values for CF and RI. 
Once I knew what my components were for the RF and CF, uh, I could determine what the maximum gain I wanted from the circuit. So I, just, I determined that I wanted a maximum gain of, of 10. So AV would be 10 times. And we know that RF over RI would give us the value of AV. So I had 22K divided by my gain of 10. I just did a little bit of re rearrangement. And then I got 2.2K ohms. So 2.2K ohms for this resistor. What I want is for the time constants or the ratios between my input and my output to be the same. I want them to be balanced. So I wanted Ri times Ci to be equal to Rf times Cf. So I knew that Ri was going to be 2.2k ohms and Ci was 4.7 nanofarads. I wanted that to be equal to 22k, because I knew the value of Rf, times Cf. So just do a, a little bit of math and move the 22k over here and I would end up getting 470 picofarads. And this just keeps all the gains balanced in the entire circuit. This is the circuit we'll be testing in just a moment. Here's our feedback capacitor and here's our RF, so there's our 22k ohm resistor, our CI input capacitor of uh, 4.7 nanofarads and then our 22k ohm input resistor we still have a positive input of 15 volts on 7 a negative 15 on pin number 4 I've also added a resistor on pin 3 which is the non-inverting input and this is a 2k ohm resistor and this was selected because it's going to give us roughly the same current as we would have on our non-inverting input. Now this was selected by just taking the value of RF in parallel with RI and that gave us 2K and that would mean that there's 2K of parallel resistance on our inverting input so I put the same 2K of resistance on our non-inverting input so it's just these two in parallel give you the value for our resistor to correct the biasing. So let's go ahead and hook this up to power, scope, and a signal and take a look at the values that we're going to get. I have the circuit hooked up and you can see the input on the yellow trace. So I have a one volt peak to peak ramp and the output is in the blue trace. And you can see it's 400 hertz, one volt peak to peak there as well. And it's doing just what it should. It's got a steady rate of change and as long as that rate of change is steady the voltage is steady. If I were to adjust the, the amplitude or the frequency, so if I adjust the amplitude by a tenth of a volt you can see the, the square wave getting larger which is what it should do as a differentiator. And we calculated that we would have a peak voltage of 82 millivolts from, from one point to the other assuming that our, our waves are symmetrical, and they are. So I'm going to make this just a little bit larger and then change the, the ground point, move it up a little bit, I think. And at, you can see ground is here, so we're at one, two, three, right around four divisions, so we're about 80 millivolts. There's quite a bit of noise in this. So 80 millivolts, and we estimated that we should have 82 millivolts, so everything looks pretty good there. Let's see if we can get rid of some of that ground, some of that noise. Oh, looks like I'm stuck with it. So if I go back to my original values for the scope, and now I input a square wave, you can see now I have pulses. And a square wave is a very rapid changing leading edge, which means that based on our theory that the rate of change being fast should give us a very fast output pulse, we can see that we have 
approximately three and a half volts in the form of pulses given a square wave, the yellow trace, at the output. And when the output goes negative, or when the, in, the input goes negative, the output goes positive. So we have the phase inversion there as well. Looking at this waveform, we can see the input is uh, still one volt peak to peak, and our output is just over 200, maybe 300 millivolts peak to peak. And that's because as far as sine waves are concerned, this is a high pass filter. If I begin to go up in frequency, the amplitude begins to go up as well. And then I should reach a, a critical frequency right around 15.4 kilohertz. And we get that by multiplying the value of RS, or R in, R I, by the value of the capacitor. So we have 2.2K times 4.7 nano, and multiplying it by 2 pi. And we should end up with a frequency, a critical frequency, of approximately 15.4, or that point where we start getting a maximum value. So if I take channel 1 out of the of the picture and bump it down, bump up the sensitivity a little bit, you can see the signal is pretty big at 14.8 and it will get a little bit larger and then it'll start to drop off again, so that critical frequency. But we're still passing it very effectively at the higher frequencies. Well, what happens then if I go back to a ramp at the input and let's go back to a 400 Hertz ramp and you can see that we have our original image uh, the ramp the square wave out. Let's go up in frequency but there's going to become a point where the output starts to look just like the input and it's at this stage that we have a straight inverting amplifier so you can see that it's roughly at that same critical frequency the the input and the outputs are roughly the same so what can we use these differentiators for one of the applications is in process controls if I know that I'm producing a product or something is being measured at a certain rate over a certain time it, it can be used to generate a voltage and by watching the output voltage from a differentiator if it exceeds a limit I know that I have a problem with my process control I can also use it to detect high frequency components or the the frequency components of an input signal and just like the integrator, I can use a differentiator in analog computers to get a better representation of biological systems. Well, that's it for differentiators. Next up, we will go into active filters with uh, perhaps a review of some of the filter characteristics from just RC circuits and then see how our op amps can do in improving the signal output and the filtering process. Thanks for watching again. If you liked the video, please give us a thumbs up. And if you have any comments, please leave them. I try to answer all of them. And once again, thank you for your time.